Hey, what's up, Gromies? Welcome to Office Hours, your source for free cannabis cultivation education. I am your moderator, Keisha, and we are on episode 83. Here's how we do it. I'll keep an eye out for questions in the Hangouts chat. Drop them anytime, and if your question gets picked, we'll get right to it. We're also going live on YouTube and Instagram, so if you're logging on over there, post your question, and we will do our best to cover it during the show. Y'all headed to MJ BizCon in a few weeks? So are we. Office Hours Live is going to be coming in live and direct from booth 51005 on Thursday, November 30th as part of Arroyo's three days of programming. There are two ways to tap in, join our live audience or watch our free live stream from anywhere in the world. Scan this QR code right here to claim your spot. You, you're not going to want to miss this one. And all right, with that, Seth, let's get to it. How you doing? Pretty good. Good, good. All right. I'm going to start with a couple of follow-up questions that came through towards the end of last week's show. Um, Someone wrote in on the topic of IPM and cleaning and sanitation. We did like a nice, good, we had a nice conversation on that. Um, This person wanted to know, would you use microbes in the cubes in your fertigation or at all to make a synganic approach? So it sounds like a combination synthetic and organic approach. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's actually a fairly popular approach out there. We've got a bunch of different companies putting out biological supplements that do everything from helping your plant uptake phosphorus to uh, increasing nitrogen availability. Um, But there's a few important aspects to look at when it comes to the application and commercial cultivation, right? Uh, You know, number one, whatever that input is, you might want to evaluate what you're bringing in and how you're going to go about it. So, you know, a more traditional approach, which I certainly did back in my early cultivation days was uh, brewing compost tea and applying that Um, certainly has its place. I would say I'm way more comfortable using that in a a not well sealed greenhouse where I'm dealing with a lot of bugs anyways, than bringing that into my controlled indoor environment, particularly if, you know, things like fungus gnats bother you. Um, it's pretty hard to take a good, well-colonized bit of compost that's got all the beneficials we want and guarantee that there's no fungus gnat larvae in there or any other bug eggs like that. Uh, prime reason, if you pasteurize it, you kill your good microbes. So got to look out for that when we're talking about compost teas. Um, also running them through your fertigation system is not prime. We want that fertigation system to stay sanitary and not grow biofilm. So any type of biological uh, supplement we're talking about, you know, there's, there's a few things to look at. Number one, they're expensive. So we want to have maximum applicable benefit, right? If I dump that into my fertigation system and it coats the inside of my pipes, that's actually a detractor. That's going to decrease the efficiency of my system. So the plants might like that, but it's going to really affect how well I can apply water and how accurately and potentially affect the lifetime of my, of my system. You know, I'm going to be replacing emitters much more quickly if they plug on me every 90 days versus every year with proper care. So that's, that's kind of step one. Um, as far as plant health goes, we do see benefits with using some different microbial applications. My recommendation is always to hand apply those. Um, another reason being, you know, uh, I won't name specific brands, but when we're looking at, you know, powderized microbial supplements, uh, the, the way those were formulated kind of come out of traditional agriculture where we would be taking, you know, a minute amount of spores and making it easy to handle with a scoop rather than I'm on a scale weighing out, you know, a uh, thousand micrograms or something like that of this minute, minute product that it's going to go into my uh, water and bloom. So, you know, if we scale that up, most commercial ag applications, you're mixing that with talcum powder or some other uh, agent that makes it easier to handle and apply on the base, on the level that we're doing. However, all that stuff plugs up your irrigation system. So, you know, my vote is use those microbes if you like them. If you think they're going to do something for you, they certainly can help, but do not ever put them through your fertigation system. And that even comes down to beneficial, you know, not insects, but (laughs) other beneficial bugs like nematodes, for instance, super popular for combating, uh, you know, root aphids, fungus gnats, different root-borne pests, don't put them in your fertigation system. Why? Well, if you have good filters, you'll probably find them in your filters. Did some of them go through? Maybe. But why risk it? I guess is what what my answer is. So absolutely, you know, the the quote-unquote synganic approach has been tried and proven, but you have to be careful about application. 
and understand what some of the outcomes might be. If I've got a room with cocoa and I go and apply compost tea to the whole thing and five days later, my room's buzzing with fungus gnats. Well, fungus gnats eat fungus. <laughs> I just introduced fungus into my pots. Now it's, it's growing. You gave them food. The positive thing is those fungus gnats, other than annoying you, aren't really hurting your plant health. Um, however, if you don't want fungus gnats stuck to your nugs or yourself, <laughs> that might be something that you really want to avoid. And then on top of that, you know, when you're buying any of these products, uh, you know, not everyone's going to take a sample of whatever and smear it out on a plate, do a dilution and do a colony count. However, freshness is important. So if you're at your local hydro store buying any of these products or shopping around, or if you order them and they show up and they're already past expiration date, send it back immediately, demand a fresh product. There's a lot of a lot of products out there and not all of them get, and in, in my experience, having bought some of these at different stores and stuff, they're not always fresh on the shelf. So that's something to look out for. You want to be making sure that whatever you buy has a healthy, stable culture and is going to actually perform for you. If you paid a lot of money for something that's expired and just because it doesn't necessarily smell awful or look bad, it's just dead, then it's, you're not going to get any return for your money. I love that you mentioned compost tea because we did get a question in from Alex along those lines. Let me, let me read this one. Um, I'm growing in two gallon cocoa, five foot plants, day 46 flower. Can I give a tea feeding? They name the product with recharge and my input feed. What would you, adv what advice would you give Alex? Um, I mean, depending on how big your facility is, you're going to have to scale up how you brew that tea, right? Um, five gallon buckets trash cans on wheels, all good options. <laughs> um, but again, just make sure you don't feed it through your fertigation system. And then also look at what you're actually introducing with that compost tea. So, you know, there's a various different types of compost blends out there and there are, uh, well, it's more popular in organic vegetable farming, but quite a few different texts on how to utilize different compost mixtures to create teas that have either a higher nitrogen, lower nitrogen, higher pK ratio, and not just directly in salts, but also some of the microbes we're putting on there and what they do in the soil. And then it's also important to understand that, hey, when we're looking at cocoa core, unless it's been amended with, uh, you know, carbon, aka activated charcoal or, you know, composted bark, we don't have a lot of places for those microbes to live. Um, there's not other food sources for them. So in your whole program, if you're only using salts and compost teas, you're probably going to have to develop a compost tea recipe that goes along a time series throughout your grow and is adjusting what you want to give them. And then understanding that, you know, uh, you know, go, going back to older organic inputs, you know, one of the classic ones that I hear about a lot is molasses. Well, why don't I put molasses on my plants anymore? Well, you moved inside and you moved out of the soil. That sugar, that molasses you're putting on was to feed a bunch of different microbes in your soil and have an outcome. So in this case, you know, when we're in a controlled indoor environment in Rockwell or Cocoa, it's not the same kind of symbiotic relationship we see in nature. <laughs> We've stripped certain parts of this relationship that aren't going to be there, such as alternative food sources for some of these microbes. Some of them eat things that are naturally found in soil and then give plants a positive product. Some of them work with plants for that product. There's an exchange where they get sugar back. So really tailoring it and trying to understand like what, what your goals are and what you want to see, you know, uh, like I said, a series application throughout the grow is going to be more effective than a one-time application, say, you know, week one, week two, and then letting it go. Most of those microbes are going to die. We're going to just see fungal bloom in the block and then you're going to be right back at fungus. So really balance, you know, uh, if you want to use a lot of organic inputs and microbes, it might end up being, a little bit more, you know, daily handwork in your garden. If you want to do it responsibly, and it's definitely going to be more cleanup at the end. I've got compost tea in my runoff on my tables. I'm going to have to scrub them harder. I'm going to have a bigger amount of biofilm, sediment, etc. Great advice. Thank you for that, Seth. Good luck out there, Alex. All right. We got another follow-up question from one of the overviews we did last week. Uh, so we did a segment talking about the ideal 
EC in flower to, uh, till the end. Um, so someone wrote in, I'm in a 10 by 10 and I hand water with a pump and all my plants are in two gallons. Should I check all of them for a runoff or just the corners and the inside? Oh, I mean, check all your plants if you can. The, the more plants you have, the more difficult that becomes. Um, you know, ideally, the smaller plant size you have or plant population size you have, the bigger sample size you can test out of. And if you're in a 10 by 10 tent, when we're looking at crop uniformity, you have a lot more control. So if we're looking at runoff every day, do you need to test every single plant? Probably not. You know, especially if it's all one strain, you can get away with probably testing two and then just rotating which two you're testing all the time. Um, however, if we're talking about do they get runoff, we want to see those plants be roughly the same size. We want to see them get about the same amount of runoff every day and be given the same amount of water every day. That's highly variable between your plants. Managing EC, pH, and everything else is going to be quite difficult. Hand watering you know, it does give you a little bit of a leg up there with the small plant population because you're not, you have control over each individual plant. But yeah, you know, the, the more control you have, the more you need data to really make decisions for each plant now that you're hand watering and really modulating that runoff. And then also, you know, something to look at is uh, what kind of watering wand you're using, what your application rate is, how carefully are you hand watering? Because that's going to partially decide, you know, how much are we going to build up EC in this media? You know, one of the me reasons we went from, you know, let's say pushing a 1.8 veg and a 2.2 or 2.5 EC feed in uh, flour 10 years ago uh, was because we didn't have technology to easily look at this data. So when we're looking at root zone EC, once you start getting into higher numbers, you're, you're playing with fire a little bit. And if you're blind, it's pretty easy to stick your hand in the fire for lack of a better comparison, you know? Um, so it, it, we always ran plants at the lower EC range and just kept up with nutrition rather than using osmotic pressure as the same kind of tool we use it for now. So when you're hand watering, that's another thing. If you don't already have it for most home growers, I always recommend getting a solace check before your morning watering, after your morning watering, and then before the lights go out and see what you're looking at. You know, if you, if you're able to actually control your watering well enough to build EC, learn that nuance and get your hand feel on doing it. Um, if you don't have a tool like that, my suggestion is typically to feed at a 2.5 or a 3.0, you know, maybe up to 3.5, but make sure you're getting very adequate runoff every day and that you're constantly rinsing towards that 3.0, either up or down a little bit, because without the tools, it's going to be a lot easier to maintain that lower EC range. When we're in that low EC range, you know, we might see uh, some yellowing general signs of deficiency if you have, you know, high light intensity and everything else is in line. So if you don't have CO2, if you don't have a thousand plus PPFD, there may not be a big reason to really jack up that EC and stack it, you know. Um, it generally is safer to, hey, my plant looks a little bit yellow, a little deficient. Okay, I'm going to feed it more nitrogen. There we go. And go, go about kind of those old school techniques. Uh, Again, though, I always encourage, especially home growers, you know, if you've got a small tent, go pick up the Solas. It's a great product and it's going to give you a lot of insight into what's actually going on rather than trying to read just your runoff and make informed decisions about that. Spot checks help. Get that, get that data in. Excellent. Thank you for that. All right. So last week we actually covered larfy buds for, for quite a bit. And we did get this question. We didn't get a chance to get to it before the end of the show, but um, Cannabis Farm wrote in, what about schwazing? Is it healthy to help also for light to reach the bottom buds? Why don't we start with an overview of schwazing? Uh, well, that's something I, you know, people will probably correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the first times I heard about it is when, you know, some I work with bought the good old book, Three Pounds of Light. And uh, I think the term gets interpreted sometimes a little differently in places. I think the intention of schwazing is to initially clean up your buds, a little bit more of a traditional lollipop and pop leaves. Some people interpret that as, hey, I'm going to go in and pull every big leaf that's not a sugar leaf, you know, at different points in the grow. And that certainly has its own risks. Um, you know, there's a few things we want to look at in terms of those lower buds and what they're doing. Number one, when we're looking at bud leaves versus fan leaves, um, and well, not just bud leaves, but actual flower leaves, what we'd call like sugar leaves, 
versus a leaf that doesn't have that. That leaf that's sticking off the bottom of your bud or the base of the branch that has no trichomes on it or very few has roughly 90% more photosynthetic capacity than the small, tiny tips of the leaves we trim off later in the end, right? So the more stripping I do, the more I'm taking away that food source, you know, those solar panels that are feeding the plant. So it's a fine balance between overstripping your plant and uh, getting enough light penetration down low. Now, once we translate that to modern growing where we've got HPS and LED setups, and then even within LEDs, it's not cut and dry, right? We have panel LEDs and high bay, you know, thousand watt double end direct replacements. Uh, Gavita 1930 is kind of the standard right there right now. Posey's got, you know, a 2000 watt. There's various others. But if we're talking about a panel LED, Schwaz that plant all you want, those lower buds are never going to get that big because we don't have as good a light penetration. We're losing a lot of energy as it's passing through the canopy and there's just not as many photons hitting those lower buds. Um, if we go down to HPS or, you know, the HPS replacement style LEDs, we're getting a lot more intense light and better canopy penetration. And at that point, you know, typically we want to go in and my rule of thumb is any book, any leaf that's attached to the base of a bud, I'm going to leave. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one, that's a food source for that bud. Number two, uh, plants are actually quite responsive to everything we do with them. So when you go ahead and remove that leaf, depending on how you removed it and when in the plant's life cycle, you can get a pretty undesirable response. So if I take that leaf and pop it off at its base, basically damage that abscission zone, there's a meristem there that's going to produce auxin it's going to produce callus and potentially start to try to push out new smaller leaves. Okay, now I've forced the plant to take production away from that bud and try to grow new leaves so it can get back into sugar production and feed that bud. Um, the other thing I've done, pending point in life cycle, is also introduce a possible point of infection slash wound on the plant. So if I am trimming, uh, especially if I decide to take a leaf that's close to a bud, which typically I don't, um, I'm also, you know, rule number one, Make sure I'm going to cut that with scissors or snips and let that little petiole, the uh, stem that goes in between the leaflets and the actual stem of the plant, die back naturally because cutting that petiole halfway and letting that die back into a twig over the next few days is going to allow the plant to use its natural processes to basically close up what that's called as an abscission zone at the base of the leaf and seal it with different phenolic compounds rather than try to uh, grow, you know, callus or scarring tissue over it. When we get that scarring tissue, we're also looking at a hormonal response that can affect bud structure. And then at the end of the day, potentially potency, you know, when we're looking at cell growth inside those buds, we've got a constant fight between several different plant hormones. And two of our, you know, key plant hormones, there are auxin and cytokinin that affect stretch and cellular division. Well, when we're growing those buds, you know, those buds are swelling. We want to dance that line between pushing the plant to produce as much tissue as possible, but we also need as many cells as possible because if all we did was stretch out those individual cells, each cell can only support so many trichomes, right? And those are really where we're at the end of the day, we're all oil farmers, <laughs> whether it's dry bud weight, you know, you still have to put that THC percentage or cannabinoid percentage on the label, right? So we're trying to maximize that. And if we make those buds stretch, and, you know, how this is expressed a lot of time is that larfier bud. If you get a loop or a magnifying glass or a dissection scope and look at it, you're going to see bigger spaces between those trichomes. Your bud might get bigger, but you're not actually going to pack on much more weight in oil. So we want to watch out for that. And then with the schwazing, you know, the biggest thing that I've seen people do is interpret it as, hey, I'm going to go take, you know, at, let's say, week three or week two. I'm going to go strip every fan leaf off every bud on the plant. That's a massive shock. And also we're not optimizing our light penetration zone. So for any given light, and this varies by style, brand, input watts, et cetera, um, we're going to have a maximum effective canopy depth that that light's going to operate at. So if I look at plant production, what, what's actually better? Am I sacrificing production in my upper buds? by ripping all those leaves off to get light to the lower buds? Or should I prune up those lower buds higher and uh, basically tune my canopy depth to what my light can actually produce good buds in? And then that also starts to lead into, you know, we're seeing a lot of people play with under canopy lighting, for instance. And, you know, one of the big things we're seeing there is like, there's kind of a, a little bit of an argument in science, right? Like, hey, 
these, uh, we're shining light up. There's not really chlorophyll on the bottom of the leaf <laughs> or chloroplast. So are we getting photosynthesis and yield increases? No, not necessarily. But one of the things we are seeing with that technology is the ability to help uh, mature those smaller larvae buds. So at the end of the day, you know, if we've got something like, uh, oh, we could all go on for days about purple strains that are known for those. Jealousy is one that I've encountered lately where we don't have good light penetration. We're looking at levels essentially of maturity or, you know, to put it better, hey, in the first 12 inches of my canopy, I got dark purple buds. Uh, at 18, 24 inches into the canopy, I've got small, loose buds that are green and aren't ripening up. And sometimes that's what we're seeing with under canopy lighting, especially with the right spectrum tuning, helping to, uh, those lower buds to mature and really match the cannabinoid profile of the rest of the plant, which, you know, is going to be better for sales and marketing down the road. So going back to schwazing, um, you know, typically if you're still using that term, I like to get a little more precise with it when I'm talking to people about what they want to, what I want them to do when they're pruning or deleafing. Um, and right there, those two terms really kind of encapsulate it, right? Like if I'm pruning, I'm taking a leaf and a bud, I'm eliminating a spot that the plant's going to waste energy on to produce a product that I know that I won't want at the end before the plants put that effort in. And so that's why, you know, instead of, uh, worrying about the term schwazing, I typically gravitate towards like, Hey, if you're looking at producing, you know, the densest, uh, best buds you can, the term lollipopping is something you probably want to look at a little more, which is basically pruning that up to, you know, three to five nodes per branch strain dependent and trying to set that plant structure early on and eliminate, you know, any of this less than productive growth. And, you know, beyond that, it also depends on what your market's looking like, or even if you're a home grower, you know, I've, I, uh, Personally, I love growing for a grade bud, but I also love bubble hash and rosin. So personally, I don't, you know, I'm not right now as of today supplying any kind of market, but for my own purposes, I'm happy to take, you know, a good third of my crop as my A grade buds that I'm going to take time to trim up and then throw the rest into the bubble bags and make hash out of it. And it's lower effort for me. Um, it's a way to utilize more of that space to actually produce THC and different cannabinoids. And for me, it fits my purposes. <laughs> you know, off of two lights, I can get plenty of flour, even if it's, you know, a third of my crop is only flour. Sure, that's plenty for me. And then when we take that up to, you know, a bigger market situation, if you're, especially if you're vertically integrated or you have your own distributing license, if you can either, you know, make some sort of extract or pre-rolls or, you know, your small sales, let's say you have some brand diversification, sometimes looking at, you know, more of these uh, conservative pruning strategies where we're not pushing it super hard is a little more appropriate. And kind of to finish on that, I, again, I'll kind of repeat myself. I've seen too many cases where schwazing is interpreted as just stripping every single leaf off the plant, basically. And a good way to think about that is, uh, looking at how long is this plant's life cycle and how much production are we losing every time we do something to slow down that growth. And we're stripping all the leaves off the plant. We're forcing it to make new leaves in order to continue growing. So we're slowing down other parts of growth by doing that. And sometimes you'll see, you know, a plant that stretches less as a result, pending timing. Sometimes you'll see a plant that stretches more because you just induced a lot of wounding and oxen production and that's causing that stem to stretch out. So really balance, you know, what you're doing. And honestly, one of the coolest things about cannabis production is, uh, man, if you did it wrong this time, take some pictures and take notes and then try something different next time. You know, especially for any of us that are growing at home and not in a big tent, try it. Just see what happens. You know, the worst you're going to do is not have as big of a yield. And if that's not putting you out of business, who cares? Use it as a learning example. Home growing, the ultimate R and D experience for sure. You make your own bubble hash. I'm all about the homemade edibles. So look at us, homesteaders. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for that. All right, Seth. We got some questions in on YouTube, and just a reminder, y'all, if you got questions, drop them in the chat. Now's the time to get your answers. Tricom Valley wrote in. All right, hey guys. So I have a little bit of a conundrum. 
I have plants in week three of flower. The sugar leaves have started to curl down on some random plants in the room and the fan leaves are still uh, praising. The plants look great for their first 14 days and then this happens. This has been happening like clockwork for the last four crops at least. The room has 1000 watt uh, DE lights, temperatures 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 60% humidity. I'm using two gallon cocoa plastic packs feeding Athena blended at recommended doses, runoff EC values uh, are anywhere from 4.5 to 6.5 EC, pH is, pH is 5.8 to 6.3. Um, they offered to send a pic if that helps. I don't know if we'll be able to show that, but yeah. What do you oh, think, Seth? How does I, that sound I, to I'd you? I'd love to see it. My first question is what's your dehumidifier capacity? Uh, ah, typically when okay. we see, you know, some of these buds with downturn leaves at about that point in time. And this is something I had fun testing recently because uh, my dehumidifier was out of commission for about half of my last run. Um, but what we see time and time again is a lot of times, you know, when you're, especially if you've got a thousand watt double under, your humidity is on point in the daytime. Right when that light shuts off, our humidity skyrockets, especially with the falling temp and basically transpiration stops overnight. If we're looking at a graph and you went up to our field capacity point. You're drying back. So you got the slope lights turn off. Now it's flat till morning. What's going on there is uh, there's, you know, a few things to look at. Number one, in the daytime, plants are using most of that light energy to photosynthesize, right? They're producing sugars. The nighttime is when that transpiration is important for uh, bringing up nutrients that the plant's actually using to build new tissue. So if we've got a really high humidity condition for part of the day, and that's when our plants are actually trying to burn up that sugar and grow the most, during that high humidity situation, that's actually affecting leaf morphology. So plants that are grown in a constant high humidity state or low humidity state are going to exhibit different morphologies. High humidity tends to give us a uh, bit droopier of a leaf. And you're going to see that as that continues, you know, for seeing it week three of flower, your plants have grown, you've added more and more leaves, and that transpiration level has gone up and up and up. And so has the humidity anytime the light's off. So at night, when that leaf tissue is growing and expanding, it's doing so in an environment that doesn't offer it uh, prime conditions. So it's adapting by growing a different, uh, not different style of stomata, but different size and numbers on the leaf. And then ultimately also, you know, affecting different veins in the leaf. We're not having that turgor pressure occurring at night because we're not getting enough transpiration. So that would be my best advice is get some sort of environmental sensor, see what happens between lights off and lights on. For me, that usually corrects that problem. All right, Tricom Valley. Good luck out there. If you got a follow up, feel free to drop it, and then we can we can talk about it some more. But uh, yeah, great advice. Thank you, Seth. All right, over on Instagram, we got a question. Sloppy Sam is asking. This is great. You just talked about morphology. You just mentioned that they want to know which veg and Gen Qs have the most impact impact on plant morphology. It's an interesting question. Uh yeah. For sure. So when we're talking about veg and generative cues, um, there's a few things we're looking at. You know, EC state is one. Typically, irrigation frequency and window are the biggest things we're looking at. So in and then, you know, on top of that, we're looking at nitrogen availability at different points in the actual flowering cycle. But the biggest thing that seems to be the most important is basically that irrigation window. So when we're looking at a generative cue, we want to make that irrigation window as short as, po you know, the shortest possible time to achieve field capacity with the least amount of shots possible. Now, that's where media dependent, you know, the smaller the media we get, and then depending on what type of media it is, you can only put on so big of a shot at once and actually get good, you know, homogenous water soaking in the media. Uh, if you put it on too fast, you get what we call channeling, where that introduced nutrient solution does not have a chance to homogenize with the existing nutrient solution in the root zone. And we're not getting that ionic exchange or uh, basically repairing of our pH or EC state. So when that's happening, um, that's not good. Probably going to be flushing out your EC. So we're going to moderate, you know, how many shots it takes to reach field capacity. But two hours is, you know, kind of general rule of thumb on the veg queue or generative queue. Going down to one hour is even better with a 22 or 23 hour dry back period. So really what we're doing 
is we're kind of tricking the plant into saying, hey, you're not getting water frequently. So you need to focus on growing a little shorter and putting on more flowers to increase your chances of reproduction next year. And then as far as veg cues go, you know, and with gener generative, one thing I do want to stress actually too, is we're, we're not actually trying to stress the plant. We're tricking it into thinking it's stressed, but keeping it healthy. Uh, we're just not giving it a lot of oxygenation throughout the day. And that's not resulting in the plant growing upward as vigorously. Uh, once we switch over to bulking, the real key there is that long irrigation window. So we're going from one or two hours out to eight, uh, depending on what kind of humidities you can achieve in VPD and if you can get an appropriate overnight dry bag. If you're not drying back fast in the day because you have high humidity, we won't be able to bulk that quite as hard. But, you know, what we're switching to is if you in gen, let's say you put on four P1s, we're probably going to switch it up to uh, half the volume and double the number of shots in vegetative. So we're getting more and more shots, which is pushing more and more oxygen down into the root zone at really even intervals throughout the day. And a good way to visualize that is, uh, you know, and this is one thing that's fun getting back to home growing. You get to try out a bunch of different styles. Uh, you know, and we're really pulsing that all day. You see similar growth to what you would see by putting a huge air stone in a good old bubble bucket. So or space bucket, there's a bunch of different names that people have used for deep water culture, but more oxygen to the root zone produces more lush vegetative growth. And that's really what's at play here. We're just trying to time those plant responses with this plant's life cycle, because once we hit 12-12, uh, now, we're, now we're on a timer, right? At different points, we have different actions going on within the plant, and we want to take advantage of that type of growth. And that's why we're applying, you know, generative growth uh, when the plant's trying to stretch. We're trying to trick it into being shorter and having more buds on it because that's more profitable for us. If we we're hemp farmers, we'd just be pushing vegetative all the way through, trying to grow these things sky high and cut down trees, you know? So then once we get to vegetative, that's when, well, what we call bulking, the plant's flipped over, it's done stretching. And now, you know, naturally it's trying to put on flowers and bulk them up. That's where we can take advantage of that state of plant growth and morphology and encourage it with that vegetation irrigation strategy. Fantastic, sloppy Sam, good luck out there. All right, we're gonna keep it moving. I Grow Dabs dropped this in, on uh, IG Live here. They're wondering when doing a breeding project, do you prefer to let the male plant flower with the females the whole time? Or do you prefer to flower it elsewhere, harvest the pollen and dust the females? What's your, what's your method? Uh, the latter. You want to separate your males and females that way you have total control because if you have a population of plants and let me let me rephrase that it depends too <laughs> but basically it depends on what your breeding goals are so if we're doing just f1 hybrids we do want to keep that separate because hey you know what i might be able to do if i catch them in time and can separate my males and collect pollen i might be able to make 10 crosses on the same female plant just by taking that and that out and keeping track of where i pollinated which different or which branches I pollinated with which different flower. There's a few ways you can do that. You know, um, I like to go in with a tiny little paintbrush, my little jar of pollen and spray bottle with good old deionized water. And the only reason I say deionized is because I have access to it and uh, it's contaminant free. Um, but basically water kills pollen. So essential move, get in, pollinate all your pistols, spray that bud a minute after you pollinate it. You're going to be good, uh, old school plant, plant breeder style, lick your paintbrush and then move on. <laughs> um, but there are other types of way, other types of generational advancement that we're looking for when we want to see variation within a particular cross or population. So if we have an F1 cross, I might be looking at, Hey, I got a hundred seeds off of this cross. I'm going to pop all those and see what I see. Well, in an F1 hybrid situation, we're going to see a few different characteristics come out by with varying height and stuff, but that's really not a good point to make selection because we haven't really seen what kind of expression we get out of that second generation recombination. So if we take, you know, cannabis back and treat it like a lot of other plants are treated in breeding, one thing we're going to look at is saying, Hey, I'm making this F1 cross. I have this F1, which F stands for filial generation. What I'm going to do is actually let those open pollinate in a room and not, not track which ones cross with each other. Because what that's doing is giving me 
a huge population with a huge variety of expression that hasn't been influenced yet by my selection, which at this point in the breeding project, my selection, I have no way of knowing if that one I selected that thought good is going to, that I thought was good is actually going to produce desirable offspring. You know, same, same way that you go buy a red delicious apple, take that seed out and plant it in your yard. It's not going to be a red delicious. So we want to, you know, in certain types of breeding, we want to take it out to F3, 4, 5, 6 with what's called synthetic breeding. And that'd be open pollination in a controlled room or area where we just want to get as much expression as possible. Now, what most people in cannabis are doing right now, separating your plants and then pollinating individually is going to behoove you. Um, you just got to understand what your goals are. If you just want to see what happens, definitely keep them separate. If you're going for a specific goal like disease resistance or, hey, I've got this one strain and this other strain that I, I really like both expressions. Number one, take it back. You got to get some male seeds. Um, I'll, I'm always a huge proponent of it. The uh, feminized crosses out there do, uh, in fact, promote hermaphroditic traits. So I really discourage people from doing reversals and obtaining pollen that way. And that's one thing that's tough. You know, we, a lot of us go by cuts or feminized seed. So sometimes with your breeding project, you, you are going to start with a little bit of a mystery and then, you know, just step it back and realize like, Hey, what are, what are my goals and what's achievable? Certain plants might be a one in 10,000 or one in a hundred thousand recombination rate to get that goal plant you're looking for. But if you're just looking at it, you know, exploring at what's out there, seeing if you can find something fun. Absolutely. You know, one thing I've done is uh, I'll have the same plants growing in a room. Once I see pollen, pollen sacs start dropping, I bag that male plant, cut it at the base, get it the heck out of there. Then I'll take two or three branches, stick them in like a quart jar of water, hang that branch over and just let it drop pollen onto a plate or tray of some sort, collect my pollen there. And then I didn't actually have to put any effort into growing that male for pollen beyond when I identified it as male, basically. Seth, are you growing anything that you have breeded yourself this year? Uh, no, not this year. Not this year. <laughs> but next I, year. But, well, I have posted. seeds. I have seeds. <laughs> that, <laughs> who knows what I'll be up to after uh, December, I think. Hopefully, uh, well conference season is kind of over right <laughs> i can be home long enough to <laughs> in a not, few weeks <laughs> yeah yeah i can be home long enough to not have my my spouse uh fill up my water res to stuff. monitor all that yeah <laughs> awesome oh uh, thank you for that question all right we're gonna keep it going our good friend chuck mangione is back on the chat today we haven't asked a question from chuck in a minute uh they actually have a two-part question so let me let me start with the first one hey keisha and seth love you guys never stop i have two questions when transplanting do you guys plant deeper so the old stem can grow new roots is it beneficial to score the stem to induce growth no, no and no. Uh, some of the best root, root growth we actually see when transplanting, um, and this is you know definitely a newer technique, although not super new, um, is actually planting that you know uh, intermediate media directly on top. So if you're in you know <clears throat> a four inch or a six inch square pot, let's say, yeah, you want to bury that in, but typically what we want to do is keep that actual transplant rooting up high and then push those roots down to the bottom of the pot. And what that's doing is making sure that our existing root ball that we're throwing in is not getting overwatered and staying too wet because it's in that top layer of the soil or substrate. And, you know, as we all know, gravity takes effect. We've got a suspended water table down below where cohesion overcomes the force of gravity and gives us our highest concentration of water. So if this is my plant and I put my root ball down in here, I have to generate new roots off the side of that stem, which takes a lot more energy and also messes with the plant's hormonal balance. That's going to induce the plant with that scoring to produce more auxin. That auxin is produced in the distal tips of the plant, so it's got to travel all the way down your plant, pushing stretch in order to get to this spot to basically you know, form roots out of that wound. Will it do it as a response? Sure. What we want to see, though, is if I take, you know, again, using this Gatorade bottle as my pot and start with my root ball up here, I can use water to push roots all the way down to the bottom of this pot. And if this pot was this big, this spot is the wettest part in the spot in the pot. I want my roots to seek that out. I don't want them to be lazy and be close to it and then have, and, and also, you know, plant structure. 
plants have evolved to have the most is it resistance to uh, stem rot, root rot. Well, you won't get stem rot if you don't bury it that deep, but basically bacterial rots at the crown of the plant, basically that intersection of soil and stem. Uh, we want to keep that about the same. It, it's cool. It will produce roots if you bury it deep, but it's there's no benefit. And in fact, you're potentially setting yourself up for some root health issues in the future. Awesome. Great overview. Thank you for that. All right. Here's Chuck's second question. If you have three identical plants and you feed them all the same, one plant has 200 PPM less, one comes out the same PPM and one comes out 200 PPM more during runoff, which outcome is ideal? They all look healthy. I mean, you got to read your plants <clears throat> and with your runoff PPM, you've got to make sure that you actually fully saturated and evenly saturated each plant. 200 PPM difference could easily be due to channeling because one plant has a more significant root mass in the other, than the other by a very small amount. So I would personally not worry about those fluctuations too much. If I'm reading runoff, I'd primarily look at pH. And then if it's fluctuating a lot day to day, make sure I'm giving those plants the same amount of water and I'm actually controlling that runoff percent. All right. Great. Uh, great answer. Thank you for that. Chuck, thank you for your questions. Good to, good to have you back on the program. Nice to hear from you. All right. Keeping it moving over on Instagram. We got this question in from Poppy Grows. They're growing in colder temps in veg, let's say 70 ish degrees. What kind of EC should I be doing? Same with VPD, looking for some guidance there. Uh, you know, I mean, if we're growing cold and veg, that's not going to hugely affect our EC input. What we're going to need to be looking at is what kind of lighting strategy and progression strategy you have in veg and then where you're starting those plants off. You know, most modern fertilizers, we're running our clones at a reasonably high EC. You know, we might be in the 1.8 to 3.0 feed range right at clone. We're adapting those roots early on to that level of EC. So as long as you're not too low, that's important and a big important or a big factor in, you know, what should my EC be in veg going into flower is what do I need as my baseline in flower? Now, if I want to hit the ground running with my lights, you know, maybe not cranked at a hundred, but fairly high. What I'm looking at is making sure I've got enough built up EC coming out of veg and generally a 4.0 at your wettest is about where we want to be to be able to continue to stack salt on top of that throughout our stretch phase. Um, if that EC coming out of veg in the root zone is too low. That's where we're typically going to be, see a plant that's stretching vigorously, growing vigorously, often looking very healthy. Uh, but if we look, went back and looked at the charts, we're not actually able to stack EC and control that osmotic pressure because we might be feeding at a 3.0 <clears throat> or 1500 PPM generally. And uh, the plants literally taking up that much every day. And then at that point, uh, <clears throat> we're more sensitive to pH swings. They happen faster and plant health can fluctuate much quicker due to the ratio of positive and negative ions, uh, basically how much actual available food there is for the plant. And then that ranging pH, if the EC is too low coming out of veg, we can end up in a situation where, hey, I fix my pH every morning, looks good in runoff, but in reality, in the root zone, my pH is super low by the end of the day before I water and correct it the next day. And that's one thing that we want to really watch out for, because once that's going on, you have <clears throat> pretty much no visibility of the issue and also very little way to control it outside of putting on, you know, economically ridiculous feed levels that may also really have an adverse effect on your plant. Because now that it's adapted to this low EC range, just increasing that input isn't necessarily going to allow it to be to fix itself. All right, cool. Thank you so much. All right, keeping it moving. We got just over 10 minutes left in the show and a lot of questions coming in. It's great hearing from everybody. All right, someone wrote in, at what point does the plant stop producing trichomes? I'm wondering if harvesting a little early is having a negative effect on solventless extraction. It's a great question. What do you think, Seth? Um, you know, I couldn't tell you exactly what day the plant stops or starts and stops producing trichomes. But what I can tell you is when we look at, especially when we're looking at solventless, uh, solventless extraction, you know, back to my bubble bags comment. Um, you know, one, one of the big things we're looking at is the physics of how we pull those trichomes off the plant, right? And if we're harvesting early, which a lot of extract producers like to do because they go, okay, once I've got, you know, my oil yield 
I'm, I'm good to go, right? I got the THC, let's blast it. Um, once we get the solvent list, we're relying on, you know, a few different things. Number one is basically getting those buds cold enough to knock the trichomes off easily. Another one is actually trichome development and morphology. So as those trichomes mature, you know, on a, well, just like the ones right behind you in your background, Keisha, if we look at those little heads on the trichome, those begin to swell later and later into flowers. So at week six, when we see a lot of people in the solventless world, let's say pulling off, pressing, and then coming out with a, a cream or off-white colored product, usually that's because we don't have very mature trichomes. And then in testing, we see that it's super high THCA, pretty low in actual THC and other compounds such as terpenes. Whereas if we take that out, you're going to get a swelling of the head. You're going to get more oil production because the longer you leave that plant in there, the more oil it can produce. And then we're allowing those uh, biochemical pathways where we have, you know, different cannabinoids maturing and changing over time to actually ripen up. So as tempting as it is as an extract producer to harvest early and get more crops in for a year, you're definitely leaving something on the table when it comes to taste, terp profile, and overall full spectrum effect on the plant. And we see that in flower too. You know, every producer, it's your, if your goal is to make money, flowering at 56 or harvesting at 56 days makes a lot more sense than harvesting at 63, right? <laughs> Quicker turnaround time, it's more economical. But certain strains, when we're grown under those conditions, we'll see, a re, you know, especially if they do a good job, we'll see a really frosty bud, but not a lot of terpene or cannabinoid maturity when we actually go to testing or even visually inspecting that bud. You know, if I hold a loop up to a uh, well-matured bud, I want to see, you know, a little bit of smoky color, a little bit of amber in the trichomes. I don't want them to all be clear when I directly look at them, and I want them to all be heavy, swollen heads full of oil. So that's one thing, you know, if you are in that business, I strongly encourage people to get a loop or even a microscope attachment for your phone and start logging what those trichomes look like at different weeks throughout the grow. So you can really dial in, uh, you know, not just your growing style, but Hey, if you're in the, if you're in the extract world, those little trichomes actually are the product we're trying to grow. So regardless of what the bud looks like, not that it should be bad looking, but regardless of when you think it looks frosty and done, we're really looking at that final little trichome as the product. So I think placing the focus on there makes it easier to produce a uh, consistent quality product. And it, the competition's getting stiff out there too. You know, That's so facts. there was a time when extract was like, yeah, harvest at six and crank it. This, this stuff's just flying off the shelves. Well, other people figure that out too. And now we're, we're seeing, you know, more of a commodity market where just because it's rosin doesn't necessarily mean it commands the price premium that it did a year or two ago. I've said it before. It's a really exciting time to be a consumer. The product assortment is just incredible, the flavors and stuff. So, but yeah, it's, it's tricky for producers because it's about figuring out that sweet spot. Awesome. Okay. Thank you for that question. Going to keep it moving. We got someone writing in here. They want to know how much PPM of nitrogen should you end up giving towards the last two to three weeks? Or should it be fully cut out? What do you think? Um, there's a little bit of debate on that. I think uh, mainly what it comes down to is what form of nitrogen you're giving your plant. So any form of nitrate is going to have a lot higher uptake potential and actual, actually preferential uptake potential for the plant. So it's not so much about whether I'm giving it nitrogen a lot uh, later in flower or giving it too much. It's about how easy is it for the plant to uptake the form that I'm giving it. And typically when we see ripening problems in late flower, it comes from calcium nitrate because we still want to have that calcium in there. And that's where a lot of people will severely drop either their nitrate input PPM or cut it out and switch to calcium chloride. Um, personally, I prefer to keep it simple. So uh, while I don't mind mixing my own salts, if I'm in a production uh, facility, for instance, I want to keep it as simple as possible and not introduce the possibility where someone's having to switch out too many components of a mix, I would rather switch them to a whole separate mix. You know, a great example is Athena with their fade product. Like, hey, we're, we're just switching to a low nitrogen, high calcium situation. So as far as PPMs go, I, I don't have a specific answer for you. I hate to say that, but if your NPK is looking like the value is 14 or 16 on your N and knowing that most cannabis specific fertilizers out there are using calcium nitrate, 
that's the ratio we really want to get down is that total nitrogen load. That's a great reference point. Excellent. Thank you for that. Okay. Keeping it moving. Super cotton mouth dropped on Instagram. When using propane CO2 generators, is there a risk of poisoning the plants if the burners are old and or poorly maintained? Any idea what the symptoms might be in that case? Uh, yeah. <laughs> really, really strange leaf morphology. You see a lot of tight twisted leaves forming, uh, strange rates of stretch, sometimes really thick stems with almost no leaves on them. And uh, you get headaches too, typically from carbon monoxide being introduced to your environment. And that's also part of what's hurting your plants. So uh, leave, leave the gas burners to the greenhouses where you can kick on fans and vent them out really quickly is my advice. They're not necessarily the most safe in a lot of controlled indoor situations. And by the time you figure out you have a problem, who knows what kind of health risks you're running just being in that facility. That would be the worst if uh, you actually had some sort of health problems from uh, breathing in carbon monoxide and high levels of CO2 because your burner's not working right. Yeah, I got to take care of the plants and the humans in that case, huh? All right. Well, thank you for that. Super cotton mouth and be safe. Okay. okay we got this question quick, from though. Gil. We were talking about breeding say. earlier. They're asking when breeding, how many times to get a stable plant? That's an interesting question. Uh, it Overviews for us, what do you think? Well, it depends on your strategy. You know, are you outcrossing? Are you inbreeding? Are you back crossing at all? And what is your definition of stable? Typically, uh, for you know, in traditional plant breeding for a variety, not all plants have quite as much uh, genetic variation as cannabis does. That's one beautiful thing we see is high rates of variation even in the same populations. But typically, four to six generations. You know, going out f one, two, three, four, five, six we start to see a population that has gone to a uh, widely variable population. And then we can start selecting and bringing it back into plants that when we cross them have a pretty predictable outcome. I know I've, I've read, I was on a, I think it was a webinar a while back. They talked about like with pheno hunting and picking a, picking a, a successful strain out of that. It can take a couple of years. Good. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. Like if, it takes some time for a good compact resource plant breeding by Jack Brown. It's uh, no longer in production, but it's a standard uh, plant breeding textbook that has been through several generations dating back 20 plus years. Uh, that's, that's who I studied breeding under. Um, and he's a pretty good, he's retired now, <laughs> but he's a pretty good authority and he's got great explanations of, you know, how genetic recombination works, how we're using statistics to calculate, you know, how, what kind of plant population I would need for this style, for this level of recombination to find that particular combination I'm looking for. Um, it's not light reading. If you don't like math, you're not going to like that book, but it's going to give you an overview of like what it actually takes and what the math involved is to get what you're looking for. And, you know, help you kind of kind of gauge your your projects to what your intended outcomes are. I mean, that's a great resource. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so we've got two questions here from Indiva that just were dropped. So these are great, great ones to cover in the last few minutes of the show. The first was, why not just check poor water EC versus runoff? Um, well, number one, definitely check poor water EC and value that more than you're valuing your runoff EC. But when I check my runoff EC, that can tell me a few things. Um, you know, number one with runoff, always check your pH all the time. But when I'm looking at my runoff EC, if I look at my poor water EC and that value is quite elevated compared to my runoff EC to an extent that, Hey, my baseline for my poor water EC at the wettest, let's say that's six. My input is 3.0 and my runoff is coming back at 1800 PPM. That might tell me I'm putting on water a little too quickly and getting some channeling. Or conversely, if it's coming back at 1200 PPM and I'm putting on 1500 PPM, 3.0 EC, that's definitely going to tell me I'm probably rushing through there a little too fast and not letting that water homogenize before pushing all the way through the pot. So it is, it is another indicator on whether we're putting on water too quickly, too fast. Um, and, you know, it's still valuable information. Hey, you know, the, the only way we learn any of this is to start assigning data points to things and then looking for trends. So even that data is still valuable. It's just 
I would say more difficult to get a series of runoff data throughout a whole run where every single day is going to be relevant compared to poor water you see. So absolutely watch it. You right now you might be taking notes on things that a year from now <clears throat> you did not realize today they were important. You will then. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And then their second question was, what if you're changing photo period to shorten certain cultivars to harvest for ice week six or seven with like 11 hours on versus 12 hours to week eight? Is that clear, Seth? Yeah. So, you know, trying to shorten your photo period, basically trying to tell the plant that winter's coming sooner. You know, we have less and less light ripen up. Um, I think there is some merit to that, although I personally have not tested that, I'll be honest. I, I definitely think it can work. You know, we're signaling to the plant, like I said, that winter's coming sooner. However, is there a huge advantage? Maybe if you're having trouble ripening up plants, I mean, you know, number one, there's, there's not going to be any great shortcuts into taking a specific genetic and getting it to ripen soon. Um, you know, historically, some people would say, hey, yeah, torture it basically, <laughs> you know, extreme dry back, high EC, flush it out, low EC, just do something to get it to turn color. Right. And really what we want to see is optimizing that plant's whole life cycle. So that might increase maturity, but it's going to come at a cost that is either potency or yield. So kind of take your pick there. Amazing. Seth, dropping knowledge today. Thank you for holding it down in studio. Chris, our producer, thank you so much. And just real quick, a reminder, Office Hours will be heading to MJ BizCon. We are going to be uh, broadcasting live on Thursday, November 30th from booth number 51005. This QR code, you want to scan that so you could tap in either by coming and joining us in person or uh, tapping into the free live stream. So we would love to see you in Vegas. All right. And thank you all for joining us for this week's Arroyo Office Hours. We do this every Thursday. And the best way to get answers to your questions from the experts is to join us live. If you want to learn more about Arroyo, book a demo at arroyo.io. And one of our experts will walk you through the ways the platform can improve your cultivation production process. While you're there, definitely sign up for our newsletter to stay up to speed on all things Arroyo. If you have a topic you'd like us to cover on Office Hours, post questions any time in the Arroyo app, drop your questions in the chat or on our YouTube, send us an email to sales at Arroyo.io or DM us. We are on all the socials, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Social Club. We want to hear from you and we will send everyone in attendance a link to today's video and post, post it in the Arroyo YouTube channel. Be sure